Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is one of America's leading public intellectuals. I would describe him as an offshoot of the Harlem Renaissance. And what he and I share in common is a fascination with the character of Mycroft Holmes, the subject of Kareem's latest book. And that, of course, is Sherlock Holmes' brother. We're going to start with some questions. I'd like to turn to the topic of segregation. What I find interesting is that, according to some metrics, in this country, racial segregation has become worse rather than better. Just a simple example. In 1988, 43% of black students were in majority white schools. Today, that's gone down to 23%. Now, we have an African-American president. In some ways, the country seems less prejudiced. How has this happened? What has gone wrong? My opinion on that is the fact that uh, the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act led to other acts that tried as hard as they could to eliminate um, segregation in housing, the practice of redlining and those types of things where uh, blacks and other minorities were denied access to neighborhoods that had been all white. So now that we've dealt with that situation uh, changing for a good 30 years or so, um, all of the, well, I say the majority of the housing uh, patterns that have developed from that is what we used to call de facto se segregation. Right. People moving to where they want to move and living with the people that they want to live with. And maybe, and this is just a maybe, but I, I think it's pretty accurate, maybe that has caused another uh, round of de facto se segregation where people now are living where they want to live, but um, the racial makeup of the neighborhood or, or, or the composition of the neighborhood is still quite similar to when uh, segregation was the law and um, people didn't self-segregate. So I think that's what it's all about. So I'm an economist, as you may know, and I've wondered if we shouldn't entertain the idea of making building easier to do in cities such as San Francisco, in essence, to deregulate high-density residential construction and get a lot more mixing in school districts. Does that make sense to you? Yes, it could if you can enforce it. The, the trick is always in enforcement. Um, people give, pay lip service to an ideal, and then um, the reality of it uh, ends up being a little bit short, and uh, we're still disappointed. Now, let me ask you another question about this new segregation. Uh, you may not be able to tell just by looking at me, but I actually grew up as a nerdy white guy. <laughs> so I can look at the numbers and see the same problem that you see. But in terms of a feel for how the new segregation has developed, due to your different life experience, what do you think it is that you grasp that maybe I can read about but don't fully intuitively get and that you could explain to us? Do you see what I'm asking? Oh, are you asking about the way um, the The patterns? way it actually works and feels, something that's not in the numbers but that you understand better than I do because you have a different and in some ways deeper, richer, longer life experience? Well, I, I, would, I would think that the fact that uh, as a black American, I can go and buy a home in any neighborhood that I can afford to move into and the law is going to back me, I think that, that is a, a, a big factor in all of this. Uh, if black people can go where they want to go and no one is going to oppose them, I think that's... Uh, that, that's a good thing. And uh, that is uh, people making their own choices on <clears throat> without, being, uh, without any coercion uh, from the law in, in enforcing something that uh, it, it, some people find odious. You know, I think you're 68 years old, according to Wikipedia. Yes. So you've, <laughs> you've been in this country for a while. The general question of prejudice through a kind of bigotry of soft expectations. How much better is that today, in your opinion? Uh, I don't think the, uh, the soft expectations have, have benefited uh, minority communities uh, very well. I think uh, we still suffer from that. Uh, and a lot of people um, seem to be able to uh, accept it and understand it because they know how terrible our public school systems are and how they have failed uh, in, in many cases to, to educate uh, the students in, in their districts. And I think that uh, that failure has led to a lot of these problems. And um, 
has uh, given rise to uh, a segregation of, of schooling where you have private schools that are for wealthy uh, white people and the public schools that have very poor teachers and very bad facilities. Uh, that's uh, for everyone else. What's uh, your we suffer uh, because of that. What's your view of charter schools? Uh, charter schools are uh, an attempt to uh, stem the flow of, of that uh, dynamic, and, and I, I hope uh, that they get something done. Um, the school, I, the grade school I went to uh, in Manhattan is, is now a charter school, mm -hmm. and um, it was a Catholic school. Uh, it's been taken over as a charter school, and um, th that seems to be the, the trend. Now, as you know, here in Arlington, we're very close to Howard University. If you look at trends, there seems to be a, a long-term decline in uh, all or mostly or majority black colleges and universities. Enrollments are significantly down, but they've played a very important role in African-American and also Caribbean intellectual history. Do you think there's still room for institutions such as Howard? Do you think their future is promising? Or how do you see those developing? What's your view there? I don't, <clears throat> I don't know how they're going to survive over the long term because the whole concept of uh, segregated schooling um, doesn't really work. So we have to uh, really figure out a, a new template to uh, make it work for everyone. We, we have to figure out a, a way in America to make our educational system work for everybody, all groups, uh, all socioeconomic uh, levels mm -hmm. need to be able to be, be included in that. And uh, that, that's not happening right now. I'm pleased to report, by the way, that a few years ago there was a study, and George Mason came out, I think, as the second most mixed ethnically, racially, and otherwise university in the whole country. That's so great. We've tried here to do that. Uh, one reader writes to me, ask Kareem, what are some highly leveraged actions we could take to improve systematic poverty in this country? Um, I, I don't know how we're going to work on the, the poverty situation unless, again, the educational system is, is up, to, up to speed and can educate people so that they can escape po poverty. Mm -hmm. You can't escape poverty uh, given that you only have, uh, you can barely read and write. That, that's not going to work. Um, you can get a job uh, lifting things or you can get a job. I, I have a friend, uh, his son is an underachiever at school and I told him to tell him, uh, well, if you can memorize eight words, he can be employed for the rest of his life. The guy said, what are those eight words? <clears throat> I said, uh, welcome to McDonald's. May I take your order? <laughs> <clears throat> but that's, that's what it's coming down to. Speaking of policies, the war on drugs, is it working? Is it racist? Is it wrecking our inner cities? What's your view? Well, I think the, the war on drugs was, was racist. Uh, I don't think it's the same now. Uh, people are starting to see that uh, drug addiction can affect any and everybody. Uh, there was an article uh, in the New York Times last week about how um, now that uh, the scourge of heroin addiction has uh, entered the suburbs and majority white communities, uh, they're starting to understand what it's all about and the um, futility in just using incarceration to try to, cu to uh, cure the problem. Uh, we have to do a better job at uh, teaching people about their self-worth and we have to do a better job at uh, giving opportunity to people who, uh, if they don't sell drugs, they can't participate in any economy. The drug selling economy is the only one that they can participate in. That, that's, uh, that's a recipe for failure. Would you decriminalize and, in essence, stop the war on drugs? Um, I, I don't think you can, like, completely decriminalize it. But um, you have to understand that there is something that we want to uh, rescue from this situation, and that's uh, people's lives. I think people's lives should be given the, uh, the, the priority in how to solve this problem, getting people off of these things and uh, understanding that uh, you know, it, it's very detrimental to uh, their future. Here's a sentence you wrote in your book, Kareem. I'll, I'll read it out loud. Tell me if you would still say the same, because that book is now a few years old. Quote, the Republican agenda seems basically indifferent to people's hardships, but I agree with its position that handouts are not the solution to social problems. Yeah, I, I, I still agree with that. 
uh, but they have to um, be open to the fact that um, the solutions that they have uh, put forward haven't worked. I, I am still anxious to hear from some of the conservatives uh, what the conservative uh, solution is for chronic underemployment and the failure of our uh, educational system. We, we need a solution to that. Mm -hmm. uh, why haven't the conservatives come forward with, with a solution? Um, they seem to think that they have the answer. So what's going on with that? Some of that may be indifference, right? Or I think it's in, in, indifference or the fact that uh, the contempt that they have for the people who are the first victims of it, which are poor people of color, who uh, that's the only uh, economy they can uh, get into. Yeah. They, they are almost forced into uh, criminal activity because of their lack of education and um, just the vulnerability that they have uh, being raised the way that they've, they've been raised. As we were chatting back in the green room, I was saying, I read you in essence as a kind of modern conservative, not in the sense of being a contemporary Republican, but in terms of patriotism, respect for the military, belief in some kind of capitalism and getting ahead, work ethic, and that you're actually today one of America's leading conservative intellectuals, I would say. Would you accept that or push back? Um, I, I value all of those things that you just mentioned, all of those uh, scenarios that you just mentioned. I, I think they're very valuable, and they have made America a great place. So um, we can't throw out the baby with the bathwater. So uh, you know, th those ideas and ideals ha have served this country uh, very well. And um, I don't think we need to abandon them. We, we just have to uh, find a way to extend them to all segments of society. Two thinkers I want to bring up who share some biographical commonalities with you, but came out, came out in very different points. So Amiri Baraka, right, originally Leroy Jones, he converted to Islam, was an intellectual, a great poet, extremely talented, uh, like you, very much a polymath. Uh, but he stayed very radically left. He had a black nationalist period. He had a communist period. Went through a lot of transformations, but no one would really describe him as any kind of conservative. Now you, like Baraka, uh, converted to Islam, but have a very different point of view. Now what accounts for that difference in the two of you? And I believe you knew him even. <clears throat> yeah, I, I did know Mary. I, I think the difference is I believe in what happened in Europe uh, during what they called the Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. That needs to happen to uh, black Americans. Absolutely uh, a type of Enlightenment where they understand, get a grasp of what is afflicting them and what the uh, cures are. Um, I think that the, the American model is, is the best in the world, but uh, in order to get everybody involved in it, we have to have it open uh, to everyone. And that hasn't always been the case. Open to far less segregation. Yeah, Very with less se attitudes. segregation yeah. and uh, just the whole uh, concept of trying to get uh, the best and the brightest, get them uh, the best education that we can so that they can uh, do what they want uh, within their power to continue to make America the great place that it is. Now, when I prepare for these talks, I do some background reading. Some of the reading I did for this. I read biographies or works on Charles Barkley, Magic Johnson, Jackie Robinson. Robinson, and early on, he even endorsed Richard Nixon, which later he regretted. He learned Nixon was a liar and a fraud, but that he even had that inclination. <laughs> Arthur Ashe, yourself. And I wondered if there isn't a pattern where African-American athletes are in the way that you are actually somewhat conservative. If I compare that to African-American intellectuals, people like Cornell West, they seem to be more radical on average, and whether you would agree with that characterization, and if so, what do you think accounts for it? Well, I, I think uh, people like Cornell West, uh, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that they were radical, but they keep having to deal with the failure of any sincere efforts by the people in power in this country to do something meaningful about these problems that we've been talking about. Um, they just try to, uh, the people who, who can do something about it just want to serve their communities and um, just let everyone else suffer. Uh, I, I think uh, people like Cornell, their frustration and anger at that uh, type of hypocrisy and uh, betrayal is uh, 
is really what motivates them. But in terms of the athletes, again, not being Republicans in the sense of today's Republican Party, but a kind of conservatism, do you think that's there in a lot of... Oh, certainly. I, I think there's uh, a very conservative uh, strain in, let's say, the black community. Mm -hmm. uh, but they absolutely uh, advocate for change sure. because uh, things have to change in order to, to make uh, success more accessible. These talks are wide-ranging, so some questions about jazz. What's your favorite Thelonious Monk story? <laughs> My favorite Thelonious Monk story occurred when I was in, I went to hear him one night. I went to hear Thelonious several nights at the Village Vanguard. I mean like 20 or 30 nights. <laughs> um, I can explain that. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't need explanation. It's uh, the no, opposite, I, which requires was, explanation. An incredible cultural experience, but a good friend of mine was the babysitter for Thelonious's drummer. So one night he had a hot date. He said, Kareem, you got to double stand in for me and babysit Corey, Corey Riley, uh, who was Ben Riley's drummer. So I said, OK, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. I, I went and did it. And uh, Ben's wife came home. She didn't know me. She was like, <laughs> but she knew who I was. And, but because I would do that for, for Ben's family, um, they said, well, once the uh, once Anes gets home, you can come on down to the Vanguard and, and catch the act. So, starting from when I was in high school through college, I, I went to the Village Vanguard anytime Thelonious was there and I was in town. I, I tried to go, and um, I, it was a great a great part of my life. Um, but the funny story was Thelonious would get up and dance sometimes in the club, and uh, the New York cabaret laws are really weird, and so. You can't dance in the club, uh, but you can stand and rock around with the music or something. I don't know. <laughs> but the longest we get up and dance, and then me and my friend uh, who babysitted for, uh, for Ben, we would get up and dance with him. So uh, Mr. Gordon, uh, Max Gordon, was the owner of the, of the Vanguard. He said, look, you can't dance with Mr. Monk. I'm going to have problems with the um, uh, cabaret commission, because uh, if you're dancing in this, it, it's no longer a jazz club, it's, it's a dance hall, and he, he would have all kinds of difficult, difficult problems and, and get uh, summoned by the, uh, by the city of New York. So um, we're trying to dance, and Mr. Gordon is pulling at us, talking about, you gotta sit down. And then Thelonious looked at us like, uh, we can't <laughs> muscle in on his act, and he continued dancing, and then he sat down. But that, that was a pretty funny night. Uh, seeing this little, Mr. Gordon was only about five foot two or three, <laughs> yanking on me and trying to sit down and let everybody see the stage. My other favorite jazz player, Sun Ra, what did you think of him? Well, I thought Sun Ra was a pretty incredible. Um, while I was in college, he would play at another club in New York called uh, Slug Saloon. He would play on Monday nights. It was just him on Monday night. And you never know, knew rather what uh, group he would show up with. He, he'd bring in different uh, sidemen each time. But uh, he was fascinating because he would uh, play straight ahead jazz and then go off into some very esoteric, uh, um, ultra modern, uh, bizarre kind of stuff. Uh, think about the difference between Cubism and Renoir. And uh, that's uh, <laughs> kind of the difference in, in some of the things that he put out there. But he, he was a brilliant uh, pianist and a great performer. Let's talk about Miles Davis just a bit. I find people play the album kind of blue too much. It's a very good album, but it's become like the Mona Lisa of jazz. You've heard, seen it so many times, it's not that fresh anymore. So what, in your opinion, is the most underappreciated or underrated Miles Davis album, and why? Uh, for me, the most underappreciated one is um, Seven, Seven Steps to Heaven. Mm -hmm. And that shows, I think, Miles' best uh, best group. It's a big argument. Uh, what was Miles' best group? The one that had Cannonball Adderley, Coltrane, Bill Evans, and Philly Joe Jones and Red Garland, or Herbie Hancock, Ron Carter, Tony Williams, and Wayne Shorter. So uh, people from both of those groups play on that one album, and all of the cuts are awesome. So I, I, I would say that uh, that's probably the best one that does not get very much attention. I like Fillmore East a lot, the kind of souped up Ditches Brew, 
sketches of Spain, the whole Jack Johnson, that ambient period. There's just a lot, a lot in the career of Miles Davis, right? Oh yeah, and for me, uh, number two is um, Porgy and Bess. Sure, beautiful. That, that is incredible. Um, and I think uh, just the whole collaboration of uh, the Gershwins and other people of their ilk with the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, very interesting, if you read the stories of uh, the Gershwins and their good friend, uh, Fats Waller, uh, Lots of laughs, and um, that's had to go to jail a couple of times for some of the things that he did. For example, he would sell, Fats Waller was a great pianist and uh, songwriter. He would sell his, if he would get a good song, he would sell it to uh, one publishing company, and then later on that afternoon, sell it to another <laughs> publishing company, and then two days after that, go find some other publishing companies to sell it to. And uh, he ended up in the Huskow for that, but he had, that's had a very interesting life. <laughs> Today, are, are jazz and rap merging into something useful, or is jazz just dead? Where, where is this all headed? I, I know for a fact that jazz isn't dead because uh, it has taken on around the world. Um, so many people around the world want to play jazz. Uh, you see jazz musicians now coming from all kinds of places that you would not think of, um, like Azerbaijan and Indonesia. and. Uh, you know, people that can sit down and, and play all of uh, Duke Ellington's uh, repertory, or uh, there was a alto saxophonist from Azerbaijan that had all of Charlie Parker's licks down, all of them. That's all he had done. Uh, it's incredible. Uh, but uh, I, I think the fact that jazz has affected uh, mus music around the world, and there are still people who uh, enjoy classical jazz, uh, will make it or survive. Um, the whole idea of uh, prophets being strangers in their own country, I think, it is uh, more or less what has happened to jazz. But I, I don't think it's dead. Uh, I, I wouldn't use that term. You mentioned the Harlem Renaissance a moment ago. And of course, you're from Harlem, and your father's side originally from Trinidad. But if we think to the Harlem Renaissance, a lot of people know Langston Hughes, Sora Neale Hurston. But the lesser known figures, you've written a great book on the Harlem Renaissance. As the years pass, of the lesser known figures, uh, who sticks with you as most underappreciated or passing a test of time or, or one that deserves an extra plug <coughs> from Kareem Abdul-Jabbar today? The one that I enjoy the most was Chester Himes, who mm -hmm. wrote these crazy um, detective novels, um, but uh, so enjoyable about uh, people that he felt were typified people in Harlem. Uh, so if any of you saw the movie uh, Cotton Comes to Harlem, that was written, uh, that the original novel was written by Chester Himes. But he wrote these really crazy uh, detective novels that make you laugh and uh, make you wonder about uh, what type of place Harlem could be. And uh, I, I've enjoyed those uh, probably the most of all the things that I've read uh, coming from the Harlem Renaissance. Harlem as a place, it's very expensive now. Uh, it has a lot more retail. It's changed a great deal, even in the last 10 years as I've gone a number of times. What do you think is the future of Harlem as a location? And has it remained like the cultural beating heart of New York City? Or will it, what's it going to look like in 20 years' time? Uh, Harlem is gentrifying now. So you know, people who want to have a spacious apartment are combing Harlem right now as I speak uh, so they can live in Manhattan and um, still have some, some space. So um, I actually tried to move back to Harlem. and. Uh, I couldn't do it. I couldn't deal with the winter until I've become <laughs> a Californian. We all can sympathize with that today. Right? So I saw all the snow out here, so I, I know I did the right thing. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, the whole uh, ambience of Harlem will change uh, just as the, the population changes. But I, 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 it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just that uh, we move on. And did Los Angeles, speaking of places, peak in the 1980s? Then Hollywood was a much bigger deal. Silicon Valley wasn't so important. There was Michael Milken, actually this other thing called Showtime, which you know a little about. Today, LA seems like it's still a wonderful place to live, but less exciting, less culturally central. Would you agree with that description, or am I missing something? I think you're missing something. I, I think it's become more culturally uh, relevant because uh, the movie industry has uh, had a more or less uh, uh, a renaissance and um, the whole idea of uh, having a place where you can make movies completely uh, is still very appealing. 
And um, it, it's taken its own identity. Uh, it's not just the, the place that you go after you leave San Francisco. You know, probably now you go to LA first and then go to San Francisco on your way home. So uh, I, I think that uh, Los Angeles is uh, still a, a very vital and, and vibrant place. Let's take a few minutes and get to your book, Mycroft Holmes, which I enjoyed very much. I would recommend to you all, if you'll oblige me, let me just speak for two or three minutes about how I read the book. Okay. And then you respond to that. Now, if you look at the cover, here's your name, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and there's the name of Mycroft Holmes. I think that's on purpose. In a sense, <laughs> you are Mycroft Holmes. He was Sherlock's older brother who collected information, knew more than Sherlock, had more information. He advised the British government. In a sense, you're coming out of a kind of, not, not quite a retirement, but you're Mycroft. You've been collecting information all this while. This book is like announcing the real Kareem is now here in the public. <laughs> and the actual story of this book is you reimagining a world in some ways the way you would like it to be. So Mycroft goes off to solve a crime with this fellow, Cyrus Douglas, who is black and from Trinidad. Uh, and they do this as equals. So it's kind of a rewrite of colonial history. Your father's family came from Trinidad. In the story, they go to Trinidad. At the end of the story, Cyrus, this is now in Victorian England, is actually allowed to enter the royal enclosure. You look at page 60. There's a, an apparently obscure reference to James Cowell Pritchard. Who's ever heard of him? But of course, in 1813, James Cowell Pritchard, if you think about it just a bit, wrote a work which in Victorian England was considered the defining statement of the equality of the races and the unity of mankind. Not mentioned in your book, but of course, Mycroft would know such a thing. And then finally, on page 10 of your book, we have Mycroft humming the tune of Figaro from Rossini. And anyone who knows even the slightest bit of information about your life knows you've been a fan of Barber of Seville since high school. Therefore, I conclude, you're Mycroft. This is your fantasy. This is the real Kareem. <laughs> Mycroft and Sirius are both you. And this is kind of your coming out party saying, I really am a writer. I'm a novelist. Here's the real me. Yes or no? <laughs> Where do I begin? <laughs> uh, I think that um, I kind of tend to be more Cyrus Douglas than, than Mycroft. And just my vision of their interaction is the fact that there was a lot of value in the colonies that the Victorian uh, British did not appreciate. And uh, in forming his friendship with, with uh, Cyrus Douglas, Mycroft, actually gets a, a glimpse at how the British colonial system has affected people and um, for, the, for the good and the bad. And um, he's, uh, he has the courage to develop a friendship with uh, a black person, which was frowned upon uh, mm -hmm. really by the, by the British. But he can see, obviously, that it, it has no value that uh, gold is where you find it, and gold in people is where you find it. So I, I think that's why uh, their friendship is so strong, because uh, Mycroft appreciates the fact that uh, Cyrus is a, is a good person with a, with a good moral center, and um, he, uh, he accommodates him as a friend because of that. And you know, Mycroft being... Uh, 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 not necessarily well-to-do, but uh, uh, a British citizen with uh, all of his, all of the wonderful parts of his life are, are coming up. He's just recently graduated from Cambridge, and um, he has a, a beautiful fiance, and he has a, a great job with the Brit British Foreign Office, who has found him to be a, a very capable uh, administrator, and uh, it's all looking up for him, and then um, things start to happen. I can't tell you about that. You have to buy the book. <laughs> but um, it's a very I, deep book. There's much more in here, I think, yeah. than reviewers are picking up on. That's one point I'd like to stress. Cool. Now we have a segment of these chats. It's called overrated, underrated. I go through some names. You tell me if you think they're overrated or underrated, and if so, why? Okay. Uh, first one, Jean Le Carré. Overrated or underrated? 
Uh, I think uh, John Le Carre, it, all the credit he gets, he deserves. Uh, he's an incredible author, and just his understanding of the Cold War uh, enabled him to write these in wonderful novels. I, I've read most of these in the, in the 70s and 80s, um, starting with, uh, well, when I was in high school, we read The Spy Came In From the Coal, and then uh, as an adult, I, I've read everything that, he, that he's written just about. Uh, really, uh, he doesn't get enough credit, I, I, I think. And uh, John Le Carre actually was um, uh, an operative for British intelligence. Uh, he worked in Germany, and he was betrayed by uh, Kim Philby, who was the uh, mole in the, if you read Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, you know that there was a mole in the British Foreign Service. That actually happened, and John Le Carre was, his group was compromised. Uh, by that, and um, they had to disappear out of Berlin and get back to England. Um, Philby did a lot of damage uh, to to their network of uh, of espionage and uh, intelligence uh, people. Michael Jackson, not the man, but the music. Oh, I, I think Michael Jackson certainly deserves all the credit he got. He was an incredible performer. Um, I, I knew Michael not very well, but I knew Michael. Um, on Sundays, uh, a good friend of mine would take them. To, to do normal things, you know, like <laughs> their dad was the typical stage dad from hell who just wanted him to work and make all this money. But uh, my friend just was very, uh, very intense that uh, they get to do some normal things. So on Sundays, this is while I was going to UCLA, he would take them and take them to a gym and we'd play basketball and then he'd treat me to, to brunch. So uh, it was a good deal for me, and um, I got to know the Jacksons, the great kids. Uh, it's really tragic about my, uh, Michael, but uh, he certainly deserved all the credit he got. We know how close you were with Bruce Lee, but what about Jackie Chan? Jackie Chan has done a great job. Uh, I, I think he's an incredible actor. Uh, I think um, he has really um, continued the tr tradition of, of Bruce Lee in, in another way in that he has made, continued to make the martial arts uh, popular and have kids uh, realize that uh, they too can, uh, they can be close to superheroes. You know. Here's a guy, I think he's from Harlem, way back when. He's called Earl the Goat Manigault, and he never really made it to the NBA, but many people claim that if he had, he would have just been a brilliant, fantastic player. And you played pickup games with him when you were a teenager, right? Right. Overrated or underrated? How good was, would he have been? Earl was overrated. Overrated. <laughs> and I'm, not, I'm not saying that because of envy. Earl couldn't shoot the ball from beyond eight feet. You know? <laughs> he could leap out of the gym, but he couldn't shoot the ball beyond eight feet, and he wasn't interested in passing it. <laughs> um, you wouldn't make it very, very far on any team if you don't want to pass the ball. So I, I don't think Earl would have made it very far because um, he had to have the ball by himself. He, he was a one-on-one -on -one player. Um, he didn't understand the team game. So that, that's why uh, I'm critical of Earl. But he, nice guy. He, uh, he messed up his life with, with drugs, uh, but tried to you know, make up for it in the latter part of his life uh, by being involved with the community projects that told kids to stay off of drugs. Uh, so I, you know, I, I, I respect I have a great deal of respect for the way he went out. Uh, he went out trying to do the right thing. Your most underrated game, I have a nomination. Going back to 1989, I still remember this game. The Lakers are playing against the Detroit Pistons. Unfortunately, that was the year of the Pistons. It was your very last year in the NBA. But in game three, although you were down 2-0, coming back to the home court, you put up a spectacular performance with 28 points, 13 rebounds, played your heart out, in my view, there's something especially noble to a performance which in a way was maybe in a hopeless setting, but I've always admired that game of yours more than a lot of the victories. What's your response and how well do you remember that game? Well, I thank you for remembering that game and uh, just the problem that we had. The problem that we had with the Pistons was uh, when the series started, uh, Magic Johnson got hurt and Byron Scott got hurt and we had to play that series without our starting backcourt, so we got swept. Nothing you can do about that. But uh, I didn't want people to see me going out uh, on, a, on a bum note, so uh, I, I gave it my best effort. A few basketball questions. And I know you've been asked this before, but I'd like to press on the details a bit. 
your sky hook was unstoppable, pretty much, right? You're the leading scorer in NBA history. You won a finals MVP award 14 years apart. That's maybe your greatest record, actually. No one could stop it. My guess is no one today could stop it. Very few players, if any, have really had a significant sky hook. And why don't they learn it? The reason that uh, young kids today don't learn how to shoot hook shots is because everybody is so enamored with the three-point shot. So the kids, they don't want two points. Uh, they don't want to work with their back to the basket. That's not cool. They want to go out there uh, in the stratosphere and shoot three-pointers. Uh, I didn't think that that worked for the longest time. That did not work as solid basketball strategy. But now, uh, when we have a time, when you have people <coughs> like uh, Stephen Curry, who can shoot the ball, he, he can, I've never seen anybody shoot like that. I'll, I'll give you an explanation. Uh, they showed Stefan uh, shooting 100 three-point shots in practice. He shot, he, he made 92 out of 100 <laughs> from the three-point arc, including seven, 77 in a row. This is just practicing, right? So uh, anybody that can shoot like that is uh, on a different plane <laughs> from uh, all the guys that I played against and the people that I saw when I first started watching the game in, in 1960. I, I never seen anybody shoot the ball like that. And if that is the coming uh, talent level of uh, NBA players, um, they're going to be forgetting a lot about the, the guys that played in, in my era and the earlier eras of the NBA because uh, the talent level of the, of the guys playing now has really risen. But they're not teaching the young kids how to score in the paint uh, with their back to the basket. And therefore, they don't, uh, a lot of them don't get to learn the hook shot. And they don't get to realize that uh, if you get close to the basket, a lot more of your shots will go in. <laughs> they don't seem to understand that. Um, that was the first thing that I learned. And uh, so I, I worked on that hook shot and learned how to get positioned close to the basket where I could get my hook shot off. But let me push on this a bit. Uh, I recall reading in one of your memoirs that you took dance lessons early on. And when I watched you play, I was a kid, you were younger. I was always most impressed by your footwork. It seemed to me you had the very best footwork. And I read in one of your books that you practiced this footwork like crazy for hours and hours and hours in seventh and eighth grade. So there's a lot of big guys who aren't going to shoot three-pointers no matter what. I mean, could the real answer be that your footwork was so good and you learned it so early? It's just hard to do. People are doing slam dunk and other things. And you had this graceful footwork, and you combined that in this coordinated fashion with the reach, the angle, everything. And it's just so hard to put that whole package together. It's not hard to put the package together, but you have to want to put it together. These guys that are playing today, they don't want to they don't, it takes too much time, they get pushed, they, they don't like that, they want to be out there in the stratosphere shooting three-pointers. It's, it's wonderful. A lot of the games now uh, deteriorate into a three-point shooting contest. And it, it's uh, really made a lot of people start to criticize the game because, uh, you know, the, uh, just the other night, uh, Kobe shot like four for 18 uh, from three-point range. Uh, and that was that, one of his better nights for this year, right? All right, all right. <laughs> And you know the fans aren't going to continue to enjoy that, you know. Um, but when you got someone like Stephen Curry who can shoot close to 50% from three-point range, uh, that ends up being uh, an advantage for his team. So. Uh, and do do you blame the economic incentives behind the culture of celebrity, or is it more of a moral failing, or some mix of the two? I think it has to do with just um, lotto fever. People lotto want fever. as much as they can get for as little effort. So um, a three-point shot is, is worth more. Uh, it's worth 50% more than mm -hmm. a, a, a shot from inside the, the three-point arc. There's a, there can be a strategy that uh, says if you've got people that can, can make those shots, uh, it's going to work to your advantage. You gave some instruction to Joachim Noah over the last year. He's injured right now, I believe. Uh, did you try to suggest he learn a skyhook? I tried to show Joachim the, the sky hook. He, he wasn't interested. <laughs> um, but um, I did show him some things that he could do defensively and uh, you know, how to help his team. And the next season, after I worked with him, he won Defensive Player of the Year. 
So I know I had some impact, and he, he thanked me, and uh, you know, I thank him uh, for, for giving me the opportunity. So uh, it's worked out pretty well. It was going well with Andrew Bynum, but Andrew finally uh, got to sign his contract uh, for $50 million. And then at that point, um, Andrew thought that I didn't know anything, <laughs> and that he didn't have to listen to me. And um, we don't know where Andrew is right now. Economic he's, he's, incentives. He's only 27 years old this year, and he's not playing in the NBA. He hasn't played in, in a couple of years, and he's not going to make it because he wasn't able to follow through on uh, you know, really learning all the fundamentals. I would make him do the fundamentals every day before practice, and he, he just thought it was boring. But um, now that he's not getting paid like he was, I, I think um, he might have a different opinion about that. But it's too late now. You've said in your other interviews that actually you applied the methods of Sherlock and Mycroft Holmes to basketball, studying your opponents, seeing things which they didn't, understanding their weak points, understanding how you could take advantage of them. So this Sherlock Holmes metaphor, you've carried that with you really since high school or maybe longer. Is that correct? Well, uh, I, I read all of the Sherlock Holmes stories when I was a rookie. Rookie in the NBA. Rookie in the NBA. So, uh, geez, I... I realized that you know, my power of observation could maybe enable me to, to get some knowledge that uh, other people might miss out on, and I paid attention. The, the classic tale I tell of, about my powers of observation had to do, uh, we had to play Detroit. They had Bob Lanier, a very fine center, and um, I heard the, old, the uh, ball boys, I overheard them talking about they didn't like going in the locker room at, after halftime because Bob and the coach were nicotine fiends and they'd go in the shower and smoke cigarettes <laughs> at halftime. So I, I heard that and I said, geez, if he's doing that, I realized that if I could get Bob to run a lot in the second half, he'd be in pain. <laughs> and so I did. So, uh, but just you know, getting those little tidbits of information, they can, uh, they can open up doors for you that you, know, you might not uh, appreciate. Let me try a few questions about religion and Islam in particular. If I think of Islam, this is what I see. I see a world where probably more people are deeply attached to Islam than to any other religion. So it has a great attraction. It seems to me economically it's helped uh, a great number of them. In this country, if you look at statistics, Arab Americans earn more than the national average. Admittedly, they're not all Muslims, but still. Uh, theologically, a lot of it makes a great deal of sense to me, more, more than Christianity. And there's a kind of in intensity of, of yearning in the aesthetic, and the notion of the, the great distance between God and man makes sense to me. And it's in some ways pretty individualistic. It's highly cosmopolitan. And it doesn't, in most cases, rely too much on a centralized clergy. Now that said, it's striking how few Americans have converted to Islam. And you have. So given these favorable features of Islam, what do you think, first, is the cultural disconnect between the United States and Islam? And this is even pre-9-11, right? That won't really explain it. And how have you personally managed to bridge that? I know well, that's sort of a mouthful, but do you see what I'm getting at? Uh, I do see what you're getting at. What I see is the fact that uh, in Western Europe, they had the Enlightenment, where people realized that the Inquisition was not the way to go. Burning people at the stake and torturing them and taking their property uh, because they did not share the same religious beliefs as you did was unjust and not what uh, Jesus of Nazareth uh, taught his, his followers. Um, the Muslim world has not had any opportunity to have an enlightenment. Uh, they went uh, from uh, the time of the prophet, w which w is seen as the, the, the ideal time, uh, to despots. Uh, kings and uh, military rulers are the uh, norm. In, the countries that are majority Muslim. And uh, fair governance, uh, not being able to uh, arrest somebody without charges, that, that, that's a given in the Western world, in, in this 
in the Islamic world, that's, that wasn't the case. If, if Nasser didn't like you, you were going to jail, despite the fact that uh, you hadn't broken any laws or committed any crimes. Uh, and that goes again and again for uh, most of the states that are majority Muslim. So they, they really haven't had the opportunity to have an enlightenment. Um, you know, there was a, at a certain point, uh, the people in Europe decided uh, they weren't going to burn people who they considered to be heretics. They would uh, have uh, a just uh, way to deal with it. In America, we figured it out by separating church and state, the ideal situation. Uh, to have people ha let them have their own moral center and uh, let them believe whatever they wanted to believe uh, about their moral and uh, spiritual center. But uh, we have a set of laws that everybody uh, has to respect and obey that uh, enable everyone to uh, have equal uh, opportunity. So that, your, your that, vision that of Islam has separation of church and state as an ideal? It, it, it would. And if, if we ask the kind of political economy question, it, this is my worry, and I hope I'm not, you know, there's so many incorrect or just lies said in the media. If I look at Muslim, even Muslim democracies around the world, like take Malaysia, Bangladesh, Indonesia, which are not hotbeds of terror, or, you know, they're what you'd call normal countries. But there seems to be some problem they've had separating state and religion. And do you think there's a tension between the doctrines of Islam themselves and the desire to separate state and religion? Oh, no, I, I think that has to do with the distribution of wealth. Yeah. All those countries that you mentioned have a lot of mineral wealth, oil mainly, but uh, some other mineral wealth. And the people who are in charge of the state want to keep, keep a hold of the wealth. I, they don't necessarily care about the morality or the laws. They just want to keep control of the wealth. So the... Uh, man who ruled Indonesia for so long, mm -hmm. uh, Suharto, uh, he had billions in the bank. Uh, and, and this is just, this corruption uh, is endemic in, in the Islamic world. And the, the people in charge in the Islamic world say, well, we, we try to rule justly, but uh, it's not. The, the family of the ruling party or, or the ruling uh, clique, whatever it is, they get the priority on uh, goods, services, and resources. Everybody else can go to hell. And that is really what the problem is uh, in the Islamic world. It, it just isn't a real uh, democratic distribution of wealth, and uh, there isn't a real e equality of opportunity. Um, the way they treat- a kind of segregation problem, right? Right, and uh, the Quran is the first uh, of, of the books to guarantee women the right to divorce, the right to own uh, property, and to be in business. And um, as you can see in the Arab world, they, that's the first thing that they got rid of. So, you know, the, the way that um, Islam is interpreted in all of those countries really goes contrary to a lot of what the Prophet said was the way to practice Islam. And uh, it is for that reason that uh, it comes across so bizarrely uh, you know, where people say, oh, we have this beautiful religion of Islam, but yeah, we have a lot of political prisoners, uh, don't worry about them. Uh, well, that, that, they go hand in hand. And uh, the fact that you can be unjust on, on that level, but say that Islam is beautiful and wonderful, um, I, I, it's total hypocrisy. And uh, that's a, a very unfortunate thing, but that's what has happened. You've written that when you were young, you used to visit the cloisters in New York. Yes. Medieval art. A lot of it was religious. Uh, in, in some way, you must find Islam, Islamic art. You've collected uh, Persian carpets. More beautiful. And I know this is hard to express, but is there a way you could try to articulate for us, many, probably most people in this audience not being Muslims, but your take on what is more beautiful that you would like to carry to all of the listeners. How, how would you put that? How, what is it meant to you? Uh, okay, I, I think um, in Islam, because you can't depict people or animals, um, they put all their artistic expression into architecture and uh, abstract art. So in the Islamic world, uh, buildings and uh, books, etc., they are developed, uh, the carpets, are developed 
this interesting thing. Um, the prophet said that uh, depictions of humans in carpets are, are OK because we walk on them. And we're not showing that we are worshiping the pictures in, in the carpets because we walk on them with our feet. Um, there is, a, there is uh, leeway there uh, and ways of interpreting uh, what the prophet had to say uh, in ways that are logical and make sense for a modern society. But um, because of the corruption that I talked about earlier, uh, the, the people who rule in the Islamic world, are, they don't care about that. They just want to hold on to political and military power and all the money. And um, that type of corruption has led to the really bizarre and um, undemocratic uh, states that we see that uh, populate the Muslim world. Are you a long-term optimist about this situation? I was, as a young man, I was very optimistic about it. I, I'm not that optimistic about it now. It, it seems to be entrenched. Um, look at what's happening in Syria. The, uh, the Assad family, uh, they're not going to give up power. Uh, the only way that they will be removed from power is uh, through uh, military means. And uh, that, that's not the way uh, things are supposed to be going. But, uh, but put aside the Middle East, well, obviously huge problems. Indonesia, Bangladesh, Pakistan, India, Nigeria for that matter, have a pretty big share of the world's Muslims. Yeah. They have their share of problems, but they don't have those problems, right? right. Are you an optimist? about those countries and the role of Islam in helping those countries develop constructively? I'm more optimistic about those countries because they have uh, a history of dealing with a lot of uh, diverse beliefs. Uh, in Nigeria, you have people who worship uh, idols and stuff, mm -hmm. and you have Muslims. Uh, but they get along together. They don't say, uh, well, geez, you don't think, well, like I think I got to kill you they, until this Boko Haram. These are, again, uh, terrorists. But uh, I, I think that it will continue to be like that. I, the one country that I saw uh, after the, um, what they call it, the Arab Spring, uh, Tunisia. And Tunisia has managed to make a move to democracy that, that's for real. Yeah. And uh, wow, that, that's the only country that, that made it that far. Um, but you notice they don't have a lot of oil. Sure. Uh, so it is not, they're, they're not trying to plot on each other. Next door at Libya, it's, insane, uh, you know, and uh, just greed and uh, avarice have uh, really affected their mindset to the point where they can't do anything rational. If there's an Islamic enlightenment in our future, do you think it will come from the U.S. and the U.K. or from, from where? Um, I think it will come from the West. Mm -hmm. it, it won't come from the places that I mentioned that are run by despots. And what do you think most generally is the role of American or, or British Muslims in the Islamic world with, with respect to that? And how do you view your own work and commentary I think it, into that? I think it's our job to, to show what Islam actually is. And uh, it, I, I'm happy about certain things that happen. I'm just talking about Southern California now. But a number of the Islamic organizations have gotten together. They, they've gone on. Uh, drives for charity, and uh, for they've opened up homeless shelters and, and done things to show that they care about America and they can appreciate the way America functions, and it's okay with them. Um, they, as, as a Muslim, we have to, to show that we can get along with everybody, and uh, that's not happening, uh, unfortunately, uh, in the other parts of the world, but uh, here, uh, in America and Great Britain, as you mentioned, they can see how democracy works and uh, see that it, it, it can work. I, I was cultural ambassador for uh, Secretary of State uh, Clinton, and uh, they sent me to Brazil. And um, the people in Brazil uh, were amazed that Barack Obama could be elected president. They said a black American could never be elected president. And we elected Barack Obama president. And that gave them a, a different idea about what democracy actually could do and achieve there in their country in Brazil. And Brazil is trying to make it an, an effort to um, be more inclusive. Uh, the wealth is unevenly distri distributed between whites and, and black Brazilians. They want to change that. 
They want to educate uh, the uh, minorities and, and the black people in Brazil and bring them into the economy because that will open up society to everybody. So, you know, the, these concepts aren't necessarily, the, the problems aren't necessarily uh, exclusively coming from uh, Islamic countries. Uh, all over the world, uh, you know, corruption and dishonesty by the ruling parties have, uh, have made things more difficult. Let me try a question integrating about religion and politics. As a Muslim, you must in some ways be a social conservative. I'm not saying the same way Jerry Falwell is, but in some ways, a social conservative. Uh, you've in some regard spoken out on behalf of Bernie Sanders, I think mostly on economic issues, but the Democratic Party, it's mostly social liberals. Do you ever just wake up and feel that somehow there is no place you belong intellectually? And is this despairing, liberating, or what, do you ever have these thoughts? Uh, no, I, I don't have it because uh, within my own heart, I, I'm at peace with myself and you know, how I've lived my life. Uh, I, I've tried to live it morally. But uh, as, as far as uh, Islamic communities are concerned, um, we've got work to do. Uh, it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, but all, all communities really have work to do. Uh, you know, it's, it's not just Muslims. Uh, all of us, uh, uh, Muslim, Christian, Jew, or, or agnostic, uh, we, we have work to do because our, our constitution and uh, our traditions uh, require that. Other than the movies you're in, which I love, by the way, what's your favorite movie and why? Oh, geez, why would you ask me that? <laughs> I'm a big movie fan, so um, just classic movies, uh, The Maltese Falcon. I, I totally enjoy that. I can, I can continue. Shane, um, The Shootist, uh, Tinker, Taylor, Soldier, Spy. Mm -hmm. um, this is all consistent with Chester Hines, too, right? Yes, yeah. yes. Um, I, I like reading Cotton Comes to Harlem. I didn't like the movie. Um, that, that's, uh, that's tough. I, I, you'd have to give me like different genres and stuff and let me go through it. But I, 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 I enjoy movies very much and um, hopefully we'll get uh, Mycroft done as a movie. When you're there in Game of Death and you're sitting in that chair, different than this chair I might add, and Bruce Lee is approaching and you're just sitting there. Of course you remember the scene, but what are you thinking? Uh, we got to get the timing right because we don't want to shoot this again. <laughs> <laughs> How long did it take to do that scene? It's about what, 17 minutes? Of yeah, sheer it took perfection. Us, took us about a day. Took you a day. They work very quickly in Hong Kong. We shot it in Hong Kong, and they work very quickly in Hong Kong because they don't do audio. It's so it was so noisy in Hong Kong during the time that the British ran the place that there was always traffic noise and people in the street. 24-7, so they would do the uh, audio portion of any movies that they made uh, would be done uh, in studio with the actors talking in, into microphones so, so that they could get all the words uh, to appear on the screen, and then they do the sound effects separately also. And what did Bruce learn having to fight against you? Bruce learned that it's hard fighting somebody with long arms. <laughs> <laughs> Bruce was what, five foot seven, five foot eight? He's five foot eight, yeah, about 155 pounds. What did you learn having to fight against Bruce? Um, that there's some very tough guys at 155 pounds. <laughs> um, what you learn is just, uh, you can't have a preconceived idea of what is perfect, what is ideal for you as a martial artist. You have to go and experience uh, some of the different martial arts and take from them what you can that works for you personally. And I think that that is, uh, the way people train now, uh, the ultimate fighting really is uh, how Bruce trained uh, very eclectically, taking uh, techniques and ideas from any of the different martial arts and, and using them. Um, Bruce Lee thought that uh, Sugar Ray Robinson was the best boxer that he ever saw. I'd have to agree with that. So Bruce taught you, you taught Bruce some things. John Wooden taught you. You've taught Joachim Noah. You've written a whole book about your experience teaching Native Americans. 
basketball, but not just basketball, really teaching them life and, and many other things. I'm trying. Yeah. So education has been a major theme in your career. You finished UCLA uh, throughout your life, have done very well. Uh, what is it you think you've learned about education? We're here at a university that you get and we don't that you would like to tell us. I don't know. I, I, I don't know if I've gotten everything. And I, I certainly would not uh, have the nerve to, th to think that everybody here doesn't get something that I got. Um, I, just, I, I just try to tell people that knowledge is power. You've got to accumulate as much power as you can. So um, that, that requires that you go to the library and that you read and experience life in ways that enable you to use that power. If you look back on your life, all the different things you've done, and you had to sum up, what's the underlying unity in all the different phases of your career? Hanging out with jazz musicians as a kid, listening to Rossini, playing with John Wooden, winning so many NBA titles, MVP awards, writing, I think, 11 books, having been in a number of very successful movies, having made a few movies yourself as executive producer and being in them. Uh, other things I haven't mentioned, your time column, being on Twitter, working with Hillary Clinton. Uh, there's actually still much more. But if you had to try to sum all that up in terms of the unity, how that all ties into the Kareem Abdul-Jabbar philosophy, <laughs> how would um, you put it? Uh, I would have to say that uh, I'm stealing this from somebody that I can't remember the quote I'm stealing, but um, life is short, but it's very wide. So uh, try to get into the width of it and uh, experience as many things as you can, and uh, maybe you'll learn a few things. Kareem, thank you very much. We appreciate it. My pleasure. <laughs> yes, question. Hi, Kareem. Thanks for coming. That was fascinating. Hi. Um, I was wondering, do you, do you think NCAA athletes should be paid uh, you know, for the value they create for the universities? And you know, do you see that ever happening? Uh, I definitely think NCAA athletes should be paid. Uh, I think it will happen. Um, I just remember someone explained to me how much money UCLA made by the fact that I was there and we won three consecutive NC2A champions. And uh, he asked me, how much of that money did you get? And I said, none. And um, he said, you gotta think about that. So, you know, that hasn't changed. So I, I think it should change because uh, they're just exploiting the athletes. There's a way that they can uh, be equitable about paying the athletes and uh, taking what they take by providing a, a, a platform. But I, I think the athletes should be paid. They should be guaranteed, at least if they go to a college on scholarship, they should be guaranteed the fact that they could continue at that school until they graduate. I think that, that is the minimum uh, that they should get. And I, I think they should be given a stipend. Uh, it's not like we're going to make them rich, but give them money to live on so that they can have a life. I was going to UCLA. Uh, I couldn't work in the off season or anything uh, like that in ways that the uh, NC2A prescribed, but uh, someone on an academic scholarship or the guys in the band, they could go and uh, you know, work. It, it, it wasn't equitable. So I, I think uh, they should just think about a way to uh, not exploit the athletes and give them the opportunity to, uh, to be comfortable while they go to college. I will alternate mics. Yes, here. Uh, thank you for your contributions. My question is, has anybody approached you about doing your life story in a movie since we were talking about movies earlier? We, um, just in Oct uh, November on HBO, uh, a documentary on my life story was done. It's called Kareem, A Minority of One. So you can go on uh, HBO online and you can, you can see it. It's, it's been done already. <laughs> <laughs> yes, over here. Uh, thanks a lot, Mr. Abdul-Jabbar. Um, and thank you especially for uh, portions of your collection that, that thank you, damn mic stand, um, that uh, made its way to Schoenberg. Uh, more than a dozen or so years ago. I thoroughly, thoroughly appreciate it. Assuming it's been asked already, pardon me, I came through hell and high snow to get here. Um, how does it feel to be on the verge of being noted more for being a, a historian 
and an archivist of uh, AFAM material than a legendary NBA player. Thanks. Well, I I'm very pleased that I've been able to be successful in a way that enables me to be considered in the way that you just mentioned, uh, that people would see me as a historian and commentator on uh, life here in America. Uh, but that's why I went to UCLA, really, to, to get my education, uh, to have that foundation in my life. So uh, it's the reason that I went to college, and I guess that's the reason why I'm here tonight. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Next. Yes, can you tell us about your relationship with Coach John Wooden and how it changed in later years, if it did? Well, I, I can't give Coach Wooden enough credit for the example that he set in terms of integrity and um, just living a moral life. He was totally committed to his Christian faith and to teaching young men about basketball that would enable them to learn about how to be good citizens. He wanted us to be good citizens. He wanted us to be good parents. He wanted us to be good, good husbands and get our degrees. And that was, uh, that was his primary focus. Uh, if you go to all of the NC2A Division I coaches today, uh, many of them would give up uh, an arm, a leg, or a favorite child to win the NC2A tournament. I'm convinced of that, definitely. But uh, Coach wasn't, wasn't into that. His primary focus was that uh, we learn a few things. And then uh, if we did well in the NC2A tournament, that, that was OK. But um, he, he had his priorities right. And um, he taught us in that way. And uh, those of us who uh, understand that have, uh, have benefited greatly. Uh, I think his graduation rate was in the 60 percentile. Uh, 60% of the guys that played for Coach Wooden got their degrees and graduated from UCLA. That's pretty amazing. The average for um, most uh, Division I colleges is, you know, in, in the single digits. Yes. You've been a hero to lots of kids growing up. I'm curious about who your heroes have been throughout your life. And a, a second question, if you don't mind, I do recall, I think, that Dr. J actually did block the skyhook once. Is that correct? <laughs> no, Dr. J didn't do that. <laughs> he, he did his own thing, uh, where, where he didn't come back down and touch the ground for what seemed to be an inordinate length of time. <laughs> but uh, no. Dr. J didn't uh, shoot the sky hook. Uh, but what was the first part of your question? Who, are, who, are, who have your heroes been? I'm sorry? Your heroes. Who have your my heroes, heroes been? My heroes, uh, Jackie Robinson, uh, Joe Lewis, Wild Bill Hickok, <laughs> and uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, Malcolm X, Dr. King. Next question. Thank you very much for being here, and thank you for bringing up Game of Death, one of my favorite movies of all time. Um, my question is if you could tell me a little bit about your friendship with Bruce Lee. And a second question, you're only able, Bruce is only able to beat you because of a weakness you had in the movie. In a fair fight, do you think you could take him? <laughs> <laughs> well, in a fair fight, I, I wouldn't have any issues with Bruce, so I don't think we would ever get to a fair fight. Uh, I gave him a lot of problems when we worked out because my arms were so long and I, I was agile enough to, to move and avoid him a little bit. So uh, we never had any arguments that would uh, engender a fair fight. So thank goodness for that. And uh, the reason that I, I, I got to, to meet Bruce because uh, I started studying martial arts uh, while I was in college and I wanted to continue uh, after I left New York and went back to school at UCLA. Uh, so somebody introduced me to Bruce, and uh, we developed a friendship, and that's how our friendship evolved. You're welcome. Next question. Great. Congratulations. You have now, we the people have just elected you President of the United States of America. <laughs> it is now your first 100 days in office, and you are given the following list of potential priorities, including providing universal health care, addressing global terrorism, fixing our, education, our public education system, uh, fixing our crumbling infrastructure, simplifying the tax code, and addressing global climate change. Which of those would you prioritize and why? Well, <laughs> let's see. You just mentioned six issues that are, have, have stumped the U.S. Congress and President Obama. 
I don't see how I could uh, figure out a way th through all of that. Um, but th all of those issues are, are, are crucial to uh, what the future of the human race is going to be about. Um, earlier today, uh, somebody complained about the, the snowfall, and I said, well, that's what we get for letting all these people in India burn coal. Um, that's, a, that's a fact. But uh, how do we influence the, the state of India? It's, it's very difficult. Uh, it's probably impossible. Uh, we just have to try to figure out some ways to, to deal with those issues and hope that uh, we get a chance to uh, get some leverage on them because uh, they will absolutely affect the quality of life uh, on Earth for all human beings uh, going into the future. Next question. Uh, yeah, thank you for being here today. Um, in, the, uh, in your book, uh, On the Shoulders of Giants, you say that if you were not a professional basketball player, you wanted to be a history teacher. Um, I am a high school history teacher. And um, if I were to walk into my classroom and say, hey, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar told me personally to tell you that history is important because, what, would, what kind of advice would you have? What would you say to them? I would say to them that unless they understand history, um, and I'm stealing again, uh, they will be uh, condemned to repeating it, which uh, hasn't gone that well for most human beings. So, uh, you know, they should uh, understand that and uh, try not to repeat the mistakes of people that have uh, gone before us. That's what that's all about. Thank you. Uh, Next question. Uh, 20 years ago, ESPN anchors did a spoof of people singing for charity in a song called Don't Walk. And this is on YouTube today, in case anybody hasn't seen it, in which they claimed that uh, players in the NBA were traveling and officials weren't calling it. And it was sort of a, a plea to, for NBA <clears throat> players to voluntarily not travel. But there was a line in the 60-second song that said, it started with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. <laughs> and and I, wondered, I just wondered how you would plead to that charge. I, I plead not guilty to that. Um. <laughs> Very few times I got called for walking because I didn't get to handle the ball much. I, they gave me the ball and it was time to score. <laughs> <laughs> so, as far as my assignment, my assignment was to score. I, I am the all-time leading scorer uh, of the NBA. <laughs> so I, I think I got my job done anyway. <laughs> they didn't count blocked shots until 1987. But I wonder how many you would have. 19, no, it was um, 1973. 70. 73, uh, yeah, 73. I, I missed four years. My first four years in the NBA, they didn't count okay, block shots yeah. as a statistic. Yeah. But they missed all of Bill Russell's. You know, I, I, they missed four years of mine. They missed all of Bill Russell's. And he dominated the league. They won 11 NBA championships in 13 years with Bill Russell at center. And we don't know how many shots he blocked. But he dominated the game. There's a, uh, there's a thing on YouTube, it's called uh, Block Art Bill Russell. If you go to YouTube, Block Art D Bill Russell, you'll see he just terrorized the league. No one could shoot near the basket. He would block their shots near the basket and get all the defensive rebounds. He was a very superior rebound and pass it out for the uh, Celtic fast break, which was uh, the way they primarily at uh, attacked the rest of the league. And, um, of his 13 years in the NBA, they only lost, they only didn't win the, uh, the world championship only twice, uh, 11 uh, world championships and, and two losses. So I, I think, um, you know, Bill Russell certainly is uh, not acknowledged uh, by what he did because of the way they kept statistics. So, you know, I, I don't complain about those four years. I, I still, when I retired, I was the all-time leading uh, leader in block shots, but uh, I think Dikembe and uh, Olajuwon have, have passed me in statistics. But if they added my first four years, probably they wouldn't have done that. But I don't care about that. I, I had a wonderful career, I, and I, I don't sit up at night and say, God damn it, they, they didn't. <laughs> I'm not worried about it. Next question. I have uh, very, uh, two quick questions. One is, who's had a better career, Kobe Bryant or Tim Duncan? And the other question is, is do you think Dirk Nowitzki's one foot fadeaway is the most unblockable shot since the sky hook? Um, I think uh, Kobe, what was that you asked me about Kobe? 
Uh, who's had a better career, Tim Duncan or Tim Kobe or, Bryant? Or Kobe. Jeez, I, I would say that Tim Duncan has had a better career just because they've been able to win more consistently, and they didn't have to rely on Tim all the time. So Kobe has, has worn his body out. Uh, he's only like 36 years old, and he's worn his body out. It's fallen apart because of the uh, stress that he had to do uh, just taking on the load that he did. But he, he wanted to, to do it that way. So, uh, you know, that was uh, that. Was that. And, and second part? Is there, has there been an unstoppable move in the NBA since the sky hook? And I bring oh, up Dirk's oh, uh, fadeaway. Dirk Nowitzki. Um, Dirk Nowitzki's shot is, is very hard to block. Um, but I don't think that he was able to have a dominant career because he couldn't do other. If he could have shot like that and rebounded and played defense and blocked shots, then he would have been all around and he would have gotten more credit. But, uh, you know, he was like a one-trick pony. But you want guys that can shoot like that on your team. I'm not saying that he, he lacked value, but he, he, would have had, uh, he would have been considered at a, at a higher level if he had uh, done more on the court other than just shoot the ball. Next question. Um, uh, two quick questions. Uh, my favorite coach right now is Greg Popovich. Would you say he's the best coach in the NBA? Uh, Got to go with Greg. Uh, he's, he gets his team to play well uh, most consistently of all the coaches that, that I've seen out there. Uh, and uh, I, I would give him credit, uh, just the consistency. And plus, you got to give their uh, front office uh, credit for, for looking for players that fit into the system, you know, players that can play defense and don't mind passing the ball. Uh, that, that's very important. Uh, and if you can't get players that uh, have that attitude, it, it takes a while before they can buy into the team concept. And second, I was, I was just wondering, um, what are your thoughts on uh, affirmative action, how it started, how it's progressed since then, and would you keep it going today? I think it, affirmative action is, uh, has done a lot of good. Um, it, it's been abused sometimes, but for the most part, it, it has done good, especially for minorities and women. It's given them the opportunity to get a foot in the door. Um, I, I think uh, people who don't like to compete against minorities and women do the complaining, uh, because prior to that point, uh, they had uh, uh, priority. So now that uh, the gates are wide open for anybody who can be successful, uh, people want to uh, try to eliminate uh, women and minorities just because they, they feel that they're missing out on something. But I, I don't agree with that. Thank you. Next question. Yeah, uh, Wooden produced a lot of great basketball players at UCLA, obviously, but it would seem to me that not very many of those great players went on to be great coaches. Do you agree with that, and can you offer an explanation? Um, I, I think that uh, the reason that a whole lot of great coaches haven't come out of UCLA is the guys aren't interested in coaching. Uh, the only one I know of that went on to coach is Brad Holland. He played with us in 1980. He ended up coaching at the University of San Diego. But uh, none of the guys have uh, had uh, an interest in coaching. So I, I don't think you can, it, it, there's not much there. <laughs> you're probably right. I, I'm thinking that you're right. Yes. Next question. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. I wanted to know whether you ever had the opportunity to meet with Warath Dean Muhammad, and if you had any recollections or impressions that you would share. Uh, meet with with Warath Dean Muhammad, the uh, the uh, the heir to the Nation of Islam after the death of Elijah Muhammad, who brought uh, no. him into Orthodox Islam. No, I, I haven't. I haven't had a chance to meet with them. Don't know those people. Next question. Uh, we already addressed paying athletes in the NCAA, but I'm curious what you think about the one and done rule. And as the the D League develops and gets more gets deeper and, and, and a more thorough system like baseball's minor league system, is there room to maybe change to you know giving kids the option if they want to come straight out of high school again or wait three years like the MLB draft does? Uh, so what, what would you do with the one and done rule right now? Do you think maybe in the future there's a better option? Which question do you want me to answer? <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you think of the one-and-done rule? Do you think that there's a better uh, the, solution? The one-and-done rule stinks, okay? It's bad for the game of basketball in college because all the talent doesn't stay there. It's bad for the pro game because the guys coming out of college that have done one-and-done 
uh, are arrogant and think that they are prima donna. Well, they don't think they're prima donnas. They don't realize they are prima donnas. <laughs> and uh, they expect that uh, they're just going to be handed a job. They come in and uh, try to dominate, and they're not able to do that. So, uh, you know, I, I don't think it's good for the game or for the individuals. Um, the, the D League is, is a good idea. Um, I think it could all be solved if the uh, Players Association in the NBA raised the age of entry into the NBA to 21. So then that means that uh, you know, some kid in, in high school isn't thinking, I'm going into the NBA in two or three years and I'm going to get all this money, because uh, it really corrupts their uh, work ethic and their humility, and um, it, it's, it's not good. Uh, I just haven't seen anything good uh, come from it. Two more minutes, one more question. Last question, please. Thank you once again for uh, coming, Kareem. Um, we've covered a myriad uh, number of questions, uh, categories. What I'd like to know is when is the last time you had uh, Voti and uh, listened to uh, Mighty Sparrow? Well, Mighty Sparrow is, uh, he's a hero in my house, you know. But I, I had some Roti like last month. I eat roti all the time, um, but the Jamaican restaurant in LA closed. Uh, I got to find another one, but I still sneak around and try and make sure I keep my roots uh, foremost in my in my sights. Thank you for your question. I'm very happy we closed on Trinidad and the Caribbean. Thank you again. <laughs>